The world's oceans have changed dramatically over time. We live in a world in which the oceans are dominated by giant mammal and fish predators. Go back to the Mesozoic and its various families of reptiles. Go back to the Paleozoic and you get gradational ecosystems of all types of weird animal groups calling the shots. From the Silurian to the Devonian periods, fish finally evolved jaws with teeth to crunch up the invertebrate animals around them, allowing them to take the top rungs of the ecological ladder. New remains of one of these fish have been found and show it to be unlike anything from its group ever found. Let's meet Alien Acanthus. The only way that most people know what placoderms are is through the avatar of its mightiest member, the Dunkelosteus. Depending on the exact dimensions of its internal skeleton, this was the world's first super duper predator with spring loaded jaws shaped like pinking shears. This massive predator was just one among many a huge group that was among the first radiation of complex fish to fill the world's oceans. These were the placoderms. Placoderms are technically the earliest jawed animals with backbones. They are an especially important group of critters for the greater understanding of the origin, evolution, and diversification of jaws and teeth. Back in the Devonian period, 419 to 358 million years ago, placoderms enjoyed their highest level of diversity, occupying all niches that cartilaginous, low-finned, and ray-finned fishes fill today. The most common and diverse group among the placoderms were the Arthrodires, a group that includes the Dunkelosteus mascot. Despite their high diversity in number and forms, the arthrodires and placoderms in general have a poor fossil record because the hardest parts of their body were the armored exoskeleton. Y yes, exoskeleton. Many placoderms had hard bony armored suits that sat over top of their internal skeleton, but underneath the skin. Like with any lineage that lasted as long as this and diversified into as many forms as this, the placoderm armor varies dramatically from lineage to lineage. Some were literally the fish equivalent of Iron Man, with their entire head encased in a helmet, including a small slit for the eyes to see out of. The more predatory forms ditched most of the armor, except for some plates around the head that helped to form a slingshot for their jaws to launch forward and punch through the armor of any other living thing they encountered. So the internal skeleton of these things is usually never found, and everyone has to infer what they looked like and how they acted from the skull alone, uh, barring some exceptionally well-preserved specimens that do actually preserve the rest of the body. <laughs> Got you there. With the diversification in armor comes the diversification in feeding. You have your guillotine jaws like Dunkelosteus. You have your scum suckers like Bothriolepis. You even have your filter feeding leviathans like Titanicthes. And now, thanks to a bunch of specimens from Poland and Morocco, we now have the swordfish of the placoderm world. The history of these newly christened spear-faced fish begins in 1957. In 1957, paleontologist Julian Kulczycki published a paper on a slew of Upper Devonian fish found in the Holy Cross Mountains of Poland. Among the squishy fish he described were sharks and placoderms, but the most relevant description was that of a bunch of isolated prickly spines. Apparently, fragments of large osseous or bony spines were frequently found in Clymenia limestones from Galizice near Hecine. Some were perfectly straight, circular in cross-section, symmetric, unpaired structures, while others were gently bent, flattened, and paired. These guys were 320 millimeters in length. At the time, Kulczewski couldn't put them among the cartilage skeleton havers, nor their acanthodian precursors. So he resolved the bits to the placoderm group without further specification. He named the remains Alien Acanthus Malkowskii. The generic name Alien Acanthus derives from the Latin aliena, which means alien, and canthus, which means spine. The specific name, Molkowski, is named after Professor St. Molkowski, the former director of the museum Ziemi in Warsaw, Poland. 
Now we jump ahead to 2024 with a new publication authored by Melanin Jobins, Martin Rukland, Marcelo Sanchez Viagra, Hervé Lelevre, Eileen Grogan, Piotr Suzrek, and Christian Klug that redescribes the Kolchevsky specimens and describes all new ones that come together to form a much clearer picture. The one that is far wackier than just spines. Those old Polish specimens were excavated in Ostrówka Quarry and Kowala Quarry, located in the western area of the Holy Cross Mountains. They're now at the University of Warsaw, Museum of the Earth of the Polish Academy of Sciences, and Polish Geological Institute, National Research Institute, Warsaw. New material of alien acanthus was discovered in Morocco over the last few decades, specifically two nearly complete skulls from the Jebier de Bois Hill of the Tofelot Basin and the Riche Belros and Madin el Emrakib localities of the Mader Basin, all of which are hidden in the Anti Atlas mountain range. These remains are stored at various Moroccan, French, and Swiss institutions. Thanks to radiometric dating methods requiring special rocks that contain the right trace elements to date, paleontologists have to use other things to date layers of rocks. In the case of the layers that contained the alien acanthus remains, ammonite and conodont fossils were used as dating proxies. These are index fossils. They tell you about how old a layer of rock is since some animals only appear at a certain time globally and some left so many fossils behind that they can be relied on to generally reliably give you a good time estimate. The types of animals that are good index fossils are invertebrates that leap behind shells or vertebrates that bred quickly and shed their teeth all the time. The ammonite and conodont fossils infer that the Polish and Moroccan alien acanthus remains date to 371 to 359 million years ago, the Feynmanian stage of the late Devonian epoch, which is obviously a chunk of the Devonian period. The fossils stored in Paris were prepared by dunking the little guys in acid to dissolve the rock around the bones and then chisel the rest off with needles. Fossil preparators made sure to take pictures of each intermediate step of the acid and chisel preparations so that they could keep track of the lines that separate all the little bones that made up the skull. The fossils stored in Switzerland, on the other hand, were cleaned of their rock by air scribes and sandblasters. Thin sections were also taken of the jaws and skulls. This is the action of slicing through the fossil until you have an ultra-thin chip that you can mount on a microscope slide, slide under the microscope, and observe any weird microscopic bone anatomy, which can tell you all sorts of things about the physiology of the critter. So now we can confront the big elephant in the room. Those spines were not spines. Instead, they were the lower jaws of a super bizarre placoderm fish. Thanks to the new skull material, alien acanthus can now be considered one of the most unusual placoderms ever found, with a lower jaw that far exceeds the length of the upper jaw. The animal had a triangular head with huge eyes, and its jaws were lined with backwards pointing triangular teeth for snagging onto prey. Now that we know what it looked like, what does that tell us about what it is? The research team tallied up all of the animal's unique traits and put them into the phylogenetic software of their choice that sorts those traits and compares them to the traits of a chosen sample of critters that are expected to be related. The results of these tests found that alien acanthus was part of the placoderm arthrodiron group called the Selenostiidae as a close relative to Amazichthys, and the both of them forming one branch of a lineage that led to a group including Melanosteus, Enciosteus, Walterosteus, and Draconichthys. So now that we know what type of fish this thing was, how did it use those jaws, and why did they evolve? In evolutionary studies, there is the concept of modularity. This outlines how body parts are modular and how they evolve. In other words, some parts of, say, the skull for instance, are easier to be adapted for a different purpose than other parts are. The Selenosteid fish seem to be more evolutionarily flexible with their jaws and not so much with their skulls, as they all had relatively large skulls but different jaws. The discovery of the super elongated lower jaw in Alien Acanthus adds further proof that a giant pointy underbite is an evolutionary advantage in the water, as Alien Acanthus was not the only one to evolve it. 
This J. Leno arrangement is found in the Carboniferous Chondrichthian Ornithoprion, the ray-finned half-beak fishes, and the Pliocene porpoise Semirostrum. However, even here, Alienacanthus does it a little differently. Its lower jaw is longer proportionally than the other animals. The two halves of its lower jaw are also not fused together, as they are in Ornithoprion, Halfbeaks, and Semirostrum. The Alienacanthus lower jaws also seem to have peculiar dents on the inside edge that would have been the site where a stretchy jaw ligament attached to reinforce the jaw connection, so it didn't need to fuse the two jaw halves. Another interesting thing here is that none of these animals occurred at the same time as one another. We have underbites from the Devonian, Carboniferous, Neogene, and present day. There was a huge swath of time with no spear jaws between the Carboniferous and Paleogene periods, which might suggest there are others out there waiting to be found. My money is on an ichthyosaur or mosasaur. The recurved teeth in the jaws seem to be good for snagging onto prey and directing them backwards towards the throat for supper time. This sort of thing is not unusual and is seen across all sorts of animal groups, but what is unusual is that the teeth themselves continue on the lower jaw past the tip of the upper jaw. Most spear jaws either have no or little teeth, or the teeth of the lower jaw end when the teeth of the upper jaw also end so that the mouth can close flush. However, this whole too many teeth thing is seen in other critters but flipped. The ichthyosaurs, Urinosaurus, and Excalibosaurus, and the saw sharks, saw fish, and saw skates all have super long overbites with teeth that continue on the jaw past the lower jaw. The cartilaginous fish use their snoots for sensing tasty tidbits in the sand and slashing them to ribbons with sideways strikes. No one is certain of the use of the ichthyosaur's jaws since their teeth hang down like normal jaws. Anyway, the lower jaw of Semirostrum and the elongated upper jaw of another placoderm, Carola wilhelmina, was once hypothesized as a sensor for food like the sharks, which is why the research team cut thin sections of the jaw of Alien Acanthus, but they found no evidence the placoderm used its jaw to sense for food. So, the team of researchers looked next to the jawless fish Doriaspis, which has a pointy protrusion with teeth sticking out of its face. This one is a little different again because the thing has no bony jaws to speak of. Instead, the mouth was just a sphincter for slurping down glizzies in the deep. Doriaspis and Alienacanthus are similar here because they both have protrusions with teeth on them. Thanks to the unclear nature of all of this, the researchers posited three hypotheses. The thing used its jaw to trap live prey, to confuse or injure prey, or to sieve through sediments in the ocean basin. The first one makes the most sense since the teeth point backwards, which would be most useful for hanging on to struggling live prey, but the authors are open to further testing. When will we get another super chin the prehistoric beast? For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.